welcome to the 10th Nordic Game Conference. Um, our guest this morning is the writer of video games such as The Secret of Monkey Island, Day of the Tentacles, Psychonauts, and uh, Brutal Legends. Some of the most humorous, outlandish, and devious adventures yet seen in the video game medium. Born in California in 1967, it was while studying at UC Berkeley that he applied for a job at Lucasfilm's Games. Uh, unwittingly revealing to the interviewer that his favourite game at the time was Ballbuster, uh, the illegal pirate version of Lucasfilm's own Ballblazer. <laughs> Despite the gaff, he was hired and uh, Lucasfilm works as a tester on Ron Gilbert's Maniac Mansion, one of the first so-called point-and-click adventure games. Next, he co-wrote the seminal Secret of Monkey Island, which is still considered by many to be the funniest video game yet made, a distinction it effortlessly deserves albeit without much in the way of competition. In the year 2000, he left LucasArts to found Double Fine Productions, creating Psychonauts, in which a young boy flees the circus to join the summer camp of psychics, and later Brutal Legend, a game in which a middle-aged roadie played by Jack Black battles his way through a series of heavy metal album covers using a flying V guitar. In 2012, he took to Kickstarter to raise funds for a new adventure game, a project that stripped past its $300,000 uh, funding target to raise in excess of $3.3 million. Despite his warm, affable persona, our guest is at times an outspoken critic of some quarters of the video game industry. He once used his insult sword fighting skills to describe Activision CEO Bobby Kotick as a total prick. <laughs> You can't just latch onto something when it's popular, squeeze the life from it, and then move on to the next one, he said. At some point you have to create something, to build something. This morning we welcome to the stage a man who has created some of the wittiest, most delightful and important video games yet released, building an entire genre in the process. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Mr. Tim Schaefer. Uh, this is, I think, just a fun experience I had 
with the community, which is a little bit of what the things that I'm going to be talking about today, how things have changed um, since uh, our experience with Kickstarter and, and Twitter and everything, I can come to a, 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 a town I've never been to and send out a tweet like, are there any good metal shows in town? And I get a bunch of responses like, yeah, I've got Kronos, some metal, it's great. And um, come down to the base and I can go there and I'll just see um, some heavy metal and meet a whole bunch of backers for our project. Um, from our Kickstarter backers, which is just this, I, you know, for me, coming from making games in the 90s, where it, it, there was no internet in the early 90s, you know, we'd make a game and just kind of send it out into the silence and you wait for like a quick review to come back, and like, I hope, I hope it's good, you know, that would be the only kind of feedback we'd get, maybe like one or two physical pieces of fan mail or something, um, and just move on to the next game, and kind of just like, that was good, like, I don't know what happened. Now if you find out whether it's good or bad, you find out right away, um, and that's exciting. Um, so, besides all heavy metal, the other thing we're here to talk about is inspiration-driven development. So, um, what does this mean? You might think this means I didn't have my speech written by the time the program was new. I didn't have to pull out a nice sounding phrase. Uh, you know, only half right. I did, um, I did write my speech rather late. But um, this is a natural phrase I've been thinking around a lot uh, and talking to people recently. Because I only recently realized that it's something that we do at, uh, at Double Fine. Um, which is, I guess, kind of somewhat unusual. I mean, it sounds like an obvious idea. Like you get an idea, and then you, uh, you follow through on it, right? But there are a lot of other pressures on you and a lot of other things that can drive what your plan uh, is as a company. And um, this is the one that has worked out uh, for us. And so, um, let's see. yeah, we just have an idea, and we go through with it, and that's the reason we do a lot of our, our things. People ask, are you going to do uh, more motion control games? Are you going to next year? Are you going to do, um, you know, more mobile or, or, or something like that? And, and it really is just based on whether or not we have an idea for it. You know, we did um, Happy Action Theater, not just because I, I saw a report showing that Connect was going to be popular, but because I had an idea for a really fun game that I could play with my then two and a half year old daughter. Um, and we made a, uh, a Met Shooter just because Brad Muir, uh, or double fine <laughs> Really, really loves them and had a great idea for one. So um, I think it's really important to stay in touch with this with what you love and what inspires you because it can be um, really hard to make games and there, um, there are other ways to make money in this world. So I feel like uh, if you're not making games out of love, then I'm not sure why you would be doing it. Um, So we have tried to build a company over the years that um, provide fertile soil for this kind of inspiration, uh, and then protect and nurture those ideas until they uh, they are ready and the team that created them are ready to be put out into the world. And then we fight for that game until it's in the player's hands. Um, we've tried to structure our business that gives us flexibility to take advantage of those inspired uh, ideas when they come along, and to give us as much creative control of them as possible, which is really important to make sure they're done right. So, um, how did we do all that? So let's start at start the very beginning with a question that I get a lot, which is why did I start on fun? And that's a good question. Uh, one that I ask myself often, laying at my desk, sitting in a revolver, very <laughs> um, the, um, the first reason I mentioned that of uh, full disclosure is not something really proud of it's more it's kind of a juvenile thing but I just don't like having um, a boss just always been someone and I think a lot of people who start companies are the same kind of mentality they're just like I don't have a boss on the end I can't tell what to do like it's frustrating to um, explain yourself to someone who has veto power over what you can do and it's not because the ideas are beyond scrutiny but because sometimes I don't know why I want to do something I, just, I just think this is the right thing to do we should really just and um and it's, not, it's very convenient to not have a boss in those moments. Um, <laughs> you know, you want to be free to make your own stupid mistakes. If you have to go that, on that, on that score, mission accomplished. We've definitely made a, a whole bunch of stupid mistakes our own way. Um, and the other, other thing is that uh, when you start your own company, you're like you're going independent. You actually end up. We well, end up spending a lot of your time trying to find money to keep that company afloat. And when you go ask someone for money. They, they become your boss in, in, in a way, and so you can um, sometimes be more free inside the company than on your own if you don't set it up right, so you have uh, re real freedom, which means real financial freedom. Um, 
which I'm proud of. So another uh, bigger reason for me to leave LucasArts um, in 1999 was I got tired of not knowing all the characters and worlds that I was creating. They're all owned by George Lucas, and now it goes to Walt Disney. And, um, and I had also no say in how the sequels were being made. And when I heard that a sequel was being made to, to Full Throttle, which is my game, without anyone consulting me or asking me, and also that it was known like this, I was <laughs> disturbed. I, was, I felt kind of violated. It felt kind of creepy. So um, I vowed from then on to like own all my own intellectual property rights, just own everything that I made, which we've almost uh, always been able to do. Um, and let me get rid of that slide. I have no reason to slide on this if I get rid of that other slide on this. Um, and another reason I started Dope Fun is I just, I wanted to have, it was quality of life. I really wanted to have this a great place to go into work every day with people that I like to work, working in an environment where creativity was valued and, and protected. You know, people were protected from all the usual pressures that are put upon them to not be creative. Um, there are a lot of them. I think every company is different and every company's priorities you know, have a lot to do with who founded the company. And there's a lot of companies founded by programmers and they're great and they make amazing, often, you know, really great engines and technology. And there's, there's companies founded by artists who might focus more on presentation or some mix of that. And then, you know, an artist founded by like a sound engineer. Oh, actually, no one would like a sound engineer on company. I always think you want just to keep my own sound, just to make them cry. Um, and so, uh, I, there are plenty of companies that focus on other things, so why not have one that's focused on creativity, especially in design? So, I didn't do it for a long time. I put off, yeah, I had the idea for starting a company years before I actually got in there to do it, and I was held up by strange, like, little well, hang ups in my mind. One of, like, I, I just remember, like, I don't want to worry about toilet paper. Like, Making sure there's toilet paper in the bathroom. I like that someone else has to worry about that and printer paper. I don't want to worry about it. Just make sure there's printer paper. And it sounds like a trivial thing. It hung me up for years. Like, I just, you know, I just, I'm not going to start coming down. I don't worry about it. Okay. And for the record, don't find us plenty of toilet paper. And, <laughs> yeah, I, that's for some reason, magically, I don't have to think about it that much. Um, and then all at once, it, 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 seemed, it seemed really possible all at once. I think because a lot of people were leaving. Uh, LucasArts and starting their own companies, and um, it's not that I thought they were stupid, but I do, they're not much smarter than me. <laughs> and I think if they can do it, I could probably do it. So, um, and then all of a sudden, it, uh, I quit my job and I started Double Fun. And um, once I made the, um, the leap, it was like, it was kind of like stepping around the curtain and seeing the world in an entirely different way, um, the way it really is, which are, you know, before that moment, I thought of the choices and opportunities I had in my life as um, opportunities granted to me by other people. Like, will this company give me a job? Will this company let me make this project I want to make? Um, and after you start your own company, you realize how possible it is to just create your own opportunities in life and how just you can make things happen out of thin air. Um, as long as you get someone to pop up So that was exciting. So we, uh, we did it in 2000, we started a company that was all about creativity and personality, it's called Double Fine, it's in San Francisco. And um, for the first 10 years or so, we uh, happily made uh, one game after another. We literally, um, that's actually how many we made in those 10 years, one and then another. Um, <laughs> Um, and also, 
after uh, 10 years, I started to feel the team bulging a little bit at the seams. Um, the actual photo of the team. <laughs> um, not so much in su pure size, but in terms of skills. Like when people work for 10 years, they get a lot of experience and they're ready to move on to the next step. And you have a company that's going just one game at a time, and I'm running that team, and there's only one of me, one of the director of the project, there's only one big programmer, one of the artists, and so on. So everyone in the company, like, no one can really move up unless I'm dead. So I started suspecting that was the plan. Um, and so um, I thought I should do about something about this until I should do something to save my own life here. And so uh, I saw it as an opportunity to also expand the company's mission, to not just produce a singular example of creativity, but to actually produce engines of creativity. Um, just like I was very inspired by salad dressing. Or um, just like Paul Newman did. So, um, you see, Paul Newman uh, made a lot of money being a movie star, he could have just given it all to charity, um, which would have been a good deed, or a series of them, and that would have been, that would have been fine. But instead, he, um, he started this company, and he made salad dressing. Um, and they make a lot of food items. I don't know if they're the sponsored here or there on stage, but they're all over the place. And, uh, you know, 100% of the revenue that they make, their profits all go to charity. And, um, which is just this amazing thing to me. That um, instead of giving one big check to charity, he created an engine that constantly produces money for charitable causes. And so Paul Newman is dead, and he's, he's passed on, but his company continues to produce money for the causes he cared about when he's alive, which is just amazing to me um, and very inspiring. So, um, so I'm not saying we're doing anything that important or philanthropic, but I, 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 I think the example is inspiring. So instead of having like, an idea, producing one idea, um, you produce a uh, machine. This is the best factory for my ball picture that I can find. He produced a machine for creating that, for creating that. It's a repeatable process and philosophy and strategy for creating ideas. Making an engine that, that exudes um, creativity instead of salad dressing. I know what you're saying, couldn't I uh, make something that created, produce creativity and salad dressing? <laughs> and the answer is that no, I'm no Paul Newman, maybe someday. But, um, so the, the way we achieved that, or move closer to that, was what we call Amnesia Fortnite. Now, Amnesia Fortnite is a game jam, and I don't need, I'm a sweet, and I don't explain what a game jam is. So you guys are probably doing one right now. You guys are laptops, are probably jamming out there. Um, <laughs> sweet, it's all newest furniture, I don't know game jam is. Um, so, anyway, our internal double find game jam is called Amnesia Fortnite. It's called Amnesia, because we forget what we're working on that moment for, and, um, it's called Fortnite. I forget why. So, it lasted two weeks. And uh, we split the company into four or five small teams, and each team has two weeks to make a game. And um, it was started very religiously uh, in like, 2007 when we felt the team was being oppressed by heavy metal. We've just been thinking about it for years at that point. And I thought, let's just let's take a break and everybody work on something completely different. It was huge morale for the whole team, and it provided a lot of opportunities for people to try new jobs. Like, some concept artists want to try modeling, everyone can switch around and try different things and try writing a project. And it wasn't a huge risk because it was only two months if the project didn't work out. And um, um, it solved that, that problem of people not feeling like they had a place to move in the company. And all of a sudden, you had four teams, you had four lead programmers and four lead artists, and there's a lot of opportunity for everybody. So, once again, I achieved death. Um, we used uh, AF, uh, Fortnite, AF to test out new ideas, but also people, you know? Oh, I'm just getting to my slides. Luckily, you can't see what's going on here in the monitor. Where was I? I'm going to skip the end of my whole time. Spoilers. Um, yeah, that's better. So, um, it gave us a chance to test out Sometimes it's scary to build a whole new project with somebody who's never led a project before. It's like, here's this $25 million game, good luck. Uh, call me when it's over. You know, this is just a, a two week uh, bet. And, um, and I've always felt that, you know, some of the I've noticed is that it's, um, you, you get more success when you make your bets on people instead of ideas. Like, there's no game idea that's so great that anybody could carry over the finish line. It's really the person who's going to make it work no matter what, you know. And so, um, I mean, there are good ideas in this world, but there's just a lot of ideas out there. And almost everybody has one idea for a game, but 
it's, it's really special so we can actually you know, make that into a reality and do all, go through all the hurdles you have to go through to make the game. So, um, if it goes terribly wrong, we've only lost, the worst case scenario is we've lost um, two weeks, and at the maximum, one human in life. <laughs> Male is actually really small, which is hard to manage. Um, now, um, now that we have multiple people running projects at our company besides me, we have to deal with some new questions. Like, what is a double fine game? Like before, it was just whatever I thought of that was a double fine game. And now we have to really answer this. And so when we started making Iron Bird Game, for example, here was this game that uh, Brad Muir came up with that had. Um, Giant nets shooting. We've never done a game with giant nets shooting before. And um, it was actually, it came out with a different title when it was first released. The first name proved to be a little problematic. It was called Portuguese War Game. <laughs> <laughs> kind of an Iron Gate in joke. <laughs> um, but we really had to think about for the first time what does it mean to be a double fun game. And from the outside, we were like, well, maybe people are expecting that this game will have to be. Like a comedy, and it'll have to have a really quirky art style, and have like big story with long cutscenes. And we really thought about is that is that really how we would define ourselves and limit ourselves? And we decided no. We we think maybe the thing that really matters to us is creativity and personality and heart. You know, the game has to have a lot of heart, even if it's got a lot of shooting. It's got to you know have a lot of heart, not just the dog, but I mean like actual heart. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so um. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was actually a good process to go through to figure out what it meant to make a game of one of our companies. And, um, and that gives us a way of looking at each new project and at that pitch to decide uh, whether it's a game that we should make. And in, in the end, the real ultimate rule is if it's something that some of the company cares passionately about, then it's a game that they'll find their name. Um, So where has this uh, gotten us? Well, before we used Fortnite, in our first 10 years, Double Fine made two games, like I mentioned. And in the last three years, we've made 10 games. We've shipped 10 games, which is crazy. Um, and we have a process now where people can see their path leading to their own game. Everybody at Double Fine can pitch a game for Mission Fortnite, so everyone might be a project leader next year. You never know. Um, which is encouraging. And we, um, we have this philosophy that's kind of inclusive, but it helps us make sure that each game really fits within uh, our, our body of products, and um, we can repeat it year after year to create new ideas and develop new talent in the company. So that's been really uh, exciting. And this year we decided to take it a step further, which is we took it public, the whole process public. And um, instead of just me deciding what games were going to be made during the region of Fortnite by sitting up in the hallway at my desk, I um, put all the pitches up on the internet, and we let uh, the public decide and make pitches of uh, 23 games and it was 30 seconds long, and we let people vote on which games were made, and it was totally crazy. But, and we'll put the whole team under um, a lot of new pressure, but it also up the excitement level. I mean, people were really excited that it, it, the world was going to see their ideas, and I think it made the quality of all the projects it made a lot better, because we, we actually let people download those projects and play them for the first time. So they ended up being a lot more polished, too. Um, and the internet, the, you know, the cloud, the people, the sort of, you know, they picked some of the games that I would have picked myself, and also some that I might have overlooked. Uh, and that was really interesting, because after I thought about them, I could see kind of the wisdom of the ones they picked, like, I had not, uh, I had not seen that before. Um, and, uh, and people ask us, weren't you scared for opening that process up and letting the fans have that kind of control, where they pick some sort of horrible game, but um, we weren't really that scared, because we just let the fans into our lives in a more intrusive way, had a great experience with it, and that was through our Kickstarter game, the Double Fine Venture. So, um, years ago, this is actually how this, this Kickstarter thing started. The first time I heard about it was, I think, 2010, I got a mail from Brandon Boyer, who was like, hey, I've got this friend, this company Kickstarter, and I think it would be a great way for you guys to fund the game. And so, I sent a mail to our, our biz dev guy and said, what's Kickstarter? And, um, this is, uh, this is what he sent back. Uh, it's a crafting model. I've seen it work for small games at like 50K, but it's completely impactful for something on the scale. <laughs> um, no way it's going to work. And so, um, he's not our best dead guy But I you know, it did seem like a long shot. I mean, the average, I think the average Pixar project was like $5,000. It's 
seems kind of crazy. Um, so we didn't think about it for a year, but then um, the guys from Two Player Productions uh, came to visit us, and they um, wanted to make a documentary about Double Fine. And I knew them from an interview I did with them for their movie, uh, Minecraft, the story of Mojang, and, um, which is great, you should watch it. And, um, I don't know what it's about, it's about, like, I assume, knitting projects that pull miners do. And they had a, um, they kickstarted that project, so they were, they were experts uh, in Kickstarter, and um, they suggested that as a way to make this documentary. And I, I like the idea of doing a documentary about making games because I love attention. That's on the Los Angeles, you enjoy it, everyone's looking at me as it should be. And, um, <laughs> and secondly, I really wanted to humanize game development in a way that it hadn't been for me when I was younger. When I, was, I remember when I was a, a teenager, I was trying to make games myself, and a friend of mine was like, we should, we should try to actually make a game that should be. And I was like, oh, we can't do that. We're just like programming teenagers. No one, no one like, you know, like us makes games. They're made by huge machines or something. Like, I just imagine that huge companies like Atari, like these, I don't know, robots or scientists and lab coats, or someone much smarter than me making games. And, and meanwhile, those people just like us who are making games. Like, yeah, it's probably that year, the same year, Mark Cerny was making World Madness, you know, he's 16 years old. And um, it just had it just, you know, there's a, I was one of those kids who's not really figured out what I was going to do with my life, and I had no insight into the kind of jobs that are out there. So I was like, if you make this documentary, people will see. Um, they'll see people, uh, you, I guarantee you, you'll see people no, no smarter than yourself making games. I mean, we definitely achieved that. We look at the documentary a lot of times. <coughs> but that's part of the goal. Um, to show people both, um, you know, that how possible it is to make a game, and also a little bit to show how hard it is to make a game, because you, when you release a game and you read, um, like, forum comments, you should really should not do it. So right now. Um, and so I don't know why they didn't enable multiplayer in that game, so it's easy to switch the drill, you know, or something like that. And, you know, you realize people don't know how hard games are to make. It's like there's a little bit of hope for me. But I mean, I really wanted to, to have people see the kind of, you know, the hard choices you have to make in making a game, the cut features, and like, um, we have to change the scope, or we have to, you know, all the trade-offs that you guys and we all have to make all the time that people don't know about when they play the game, because they just wanted to get that all on film. And, um, and we really wanted to show everything. I really wanted to show um, all the good meetings, the fun meetings, the great story meetings, and all the bad meetings. You're just sitting there with your head in your hands trying to figure out how to get out of this hole that you've dug yourself into. And um, I knew that if we, if we did a game with a publisher, that they wouldn't want us to show them all that stuff. Um, and uh, I, I kind of secretly wanted to show all that stuff, especially phone calls with the, with the publishers where they asked us to completely change our game for no reason or didn't approve a milestone because we didn't have eight clouds in one scene like we said we would. So I really wanted to show all that stuff, but um, I knew they wouldn't approve it. So uh, the idea came up with, what if we actually, instead of just kickstarting a documentary, we kickstarted like, a little game too. Let's make a little game, which is like a demo of like, what making games are like. Um, and that seemed like a good idea. So we just started to kickstart a documentary and a game. So the game was, it's, it's just funny to think that the game was kind of an afterthought at first. And we didn't even know what it was going to be. Um, so when I sat down to think about what this game should be, I was asking myself, like, what is special about this opportunity? What kind of game can we make this way that we couldn't make any other way at the time? And that's how it became an adventure game. Um, we, uh, <laughs> this, this slide could be so many different things. <laughs>
were accountable to no one else except for the backers, who are the players. And those are the people you always want to please anyway. We're all, when we're making a game, we're like, we hope the players like it, right? So they've always been our boss, and now they actually were our boss, and the only people we had to, to answer to. Um, and that's been incredibly liberating and, and rewarding. Um, it was also good for a lot of emotional reasons, because it was just like this outpouring of positive energy from the community. It's like love and happiness, tidal wave, it was washing over us. Um, and we had a tough year that year, a lot of canceled projects, and having one of those, um, you know, having the energy to the back of this really welcome boost. Um, if you've ever seen this wonderful life that you've seen, we're just having a rough time and wishing he'd never been born. I mean, he suffers, but it seems to be like the final straw, and he's going to end him. And then when the town hears that he's in trouble, they all show up to his house and they dump a pack some money on his head. That's a good thing. Um, and it was not so really nice. And even people who, um, who didn't work on the product, the whole company felt this, like, just this great, this great feeling of, su of support from the, the community. Um, and then the community itself, here's a picture of the community. <laughs> um, it, it was a great, I felt, I, I, didn't, I didn't really expect this, but I saw like how great they felt about it. it like there'll be a YouTube rant where one of our backers is just going, this is so great, because I get to, I get to show like you, you, you know, publishers always treat us like we're pirates with the DRM and everything, and here's something that we don't have to pay for, and we're totally paying for it. And when you just don't treat us like, if you don't act like a bunch of dicks, we'll pay for stuff, right? And this is like, these people were making a statement of like their own power, which is really, um, really great. Um, so, and, and it changed our whole relationship with our community, and it turned us into a company that has a really open policy now with its, um, with its community. Whereas before, you know, I came from a, here's a picture of Scott on the ranch. I, um, I, came, I came from LucasArts, and there's a habit of secrecy there. I'm looking like I'm holding secrets. Um, <laughs> I'm realizing as I put this up, one of the secret rules that it starts to don't show pictures of the ranch, so don't tell anyone to show you this picture. So, um, I mean, you know, George Lucas gets a really tight grip on the Star Wars secrets, and he um, doesn't want anyone to see any of the scripts in advance, you know? And I think now we saw episode one, we know why. But, um, <laughs> he was a cheap shot. Only cheap shot. Okay, so <laughs> with games, it's really debatable what kind of value secrecy has. I mean, I think indie game developers are really showing a new way of marketing their own games where they, they start talking about them a year in advance and building hype about them, like Raid or, or Sweet Boy. Uh, those games have really been innovative, I think, in their approach to that and, and shown that you don't have to like, hoard all your information and release it in one big next app video. So um, our um, original instinct was that, uh, like, and really, I was really averse to showing in progress concept art. Like, what if, what if they don't like it? Or what if we end up changing the concept art? They, they wish they liked the original one. Like, it'll be terrible. They'll, they'll hate us. And um, it turned out not to be true. Like, you, you, if you air your dirty laundry, it seems like counterintuitive. You think they'll abandon you. But in fact, opposites are true. They, they get more invested. And they, they rally behind you even more. Um, and it seems like when we do an episode of our documentary, where we put something out that's kind of scary, like the meeting when we talk about, you know, the budget and if I can bring the game scope down to the budget. And we think we're going to get just this total rebellion from our backers, and every time they kind of rally behind it, and like, it's like their project and they want to help us succeed. Um, and so that's been a big reassuring thing, just opening up the, I feel like they're opening up the doors to the chocolate factory, for a really long reference there, and, um, and letting people in. And it's been uh, just a, a reintegration of our, our whole company. Um, so that's what made Broken Man the game that we're making with all that Kickstarter money. Um, really emotionally rewarding for, for me and the team. And this game is an uh, old school point click graphic adventure, just like we promised in our, in our pitch video. And making it's been interesting because I've been slowly remembering how to make one of these things and also remembering how hard they are to make. Um, possibly when we stop making them because they're pretty tough. Um, in adventure games, every single environment or puzzle or every moment is a one-off handcrafted moment, at least the way that we've always made them. That you don't really leverage your assets that much. You don't, you don't make a system or create a system of a behavior that is used in a whole bunch of different ways all through the game to extend the gameplay out. You make, like, in a, in a regular game, you'll have, you'll put an exploding barrel, and I'm um, sorry if I grabbed this from your game or your development engine. <laughs> um, I, uh, um, You'll, 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 you'll create an exploding barrel and use it in a whole bunch of different situations in your game. But um, in an adventure game, that exploding barrel 
would be individually painted, it would have a name, it would and it would have a backstory, you know, like some baggage about his mother, and of course, you know, the would look different, and blow up different than any other bear on the game. Oh no, that's Chet, don't talk to him with his mother. No, no. <laughs> So in the old days, there was a lot of pressures. Um, every time we made an adventure game, there was a lot of pressure to make them sell better. They're not reaching enough people, you know. And, um, we were always trying to figure out why uh, why they were, you know, considered kind of niche at the time. Um, and we thought it was the pacing, and so we were always trying to do things to liven them up, and shorten the dialogue, and shorten the cutscenes, and maybe add an action sequence to do something. And um, although it's really good to edit your dialogue. Down, you know, I think the body games could really hit the battle down a lot more. Because um, it just makes it tighter and, and snappier. But um, I also felt like we were kind of apologizing for making adventure games by trying to do these things. You know, and, and this this has been this has been fun for making games for the backers who I feel like pretty safe assuming that they like adventure games because they back the product. So I'm making this completely unapologetic game where like I think I know what you guys like and you're you have got we got that scenes and dialogue trees and you're you know, still editing it down to be to be good, but we're not feeling like we need to um, sell the game to someone who doesn't want it to, um, which, which is amazingly new. Um, yeah, and that's, that's all, that all comes from having just a new boss, which is the backers. So, um, now, so here we are, we have multiple, multiple projects now. Uh, going on double fine. We have multiple revenue streams which we need to be more stable. We're not sitting up at night wondering how we're going to make payroll. And instead of a monkey swinging from vine to vine, it's like a four armed monkey swinging through multiple vines to his hand. I should spend more time on that for him. What's that? Creature with four arms. Wait, okay, I just saw John Carter was on the way. So one of those aliens from John Carter with four arms swinging through a jungle. That's not us. Um, <laughs> We're also self-publishing, which means we get to actually keep the money our games make, which is crazy and new. Um, standard publishing contracts, uh, the phrase I've heard is they, they reverse engineer the profits out of the games for the developers usually. I mean, it's just, it's just um, they, unless you really do a huge hit, it's just, you have to, because of the way the, um, the deals are made, usually you don't just have to break even with your game before you get royalties, you have to break even three or four times, I don't have to tell them. So you guys about that. So um, after self-publishing some of our own games, and then all of a sudden we get these checks for people buy them, and we get to have the money. This is still something we're getting used to. So it's very unusual. Um, and it's letting us do things because we can self-publish. We can do things like the humble indie bundle. We just did a humble indie bundle for um, all of our games, and it, it, it made a nice sum of money. And like it made like two hundred and seventy. It made a bunch of money. 100, Two hundred fifty thousand. We don't know yet. Which money for charity, you know, and that's something that we don't only do with games that we are self-publishing. Um, so just a lot more flexibility. Here. And we have choices, and we don't. We do. We do still have good publishing partners. Like we still work with publishers that are. We have good partnerships with, and we like them. Not all publishers are bad, despite what you've heard. But um, it means that we have options now, and we only have to work with the good partners, and we can choose. And I don't think things like Kickstarter are going to. Completely get rid of publishers. Yeah, we see right away. But I mean, um, but it does mean I think that, that that publishers will have to look at the deals they're offering developers and really see now that they're you know it used to be they had a monopoly on certain things like financing, manufacturing, distribution, marketing, and sales. And now developers can do a lot of that stuff for themselves. There's no manufacturing for digital games and distribution, and if you finance your Kickstarter and you hire your own marketing people. I think publishers are having to look, what can we actually now, what value do we actually have to offer now? And hopefully, I think that will mean they'll start, I like to think they'll start, they'll make way for better deals being offered to developers, at least I hope so, um, for the publisher's sake. So, um, I think that's a good thing. So, um, we still have the, the, the final thing I want to say is that we have you know, some interesting things happening right now where, because of these options, we still have. Um, we still work with publishers, and I still pitch to them. And just the other day, we got an offer to publish one of our games. It was really unusual because we were looking at the offer and what they're offering to give us, and also what the things that we're going to take, and um, kind of some of the standard things like the IP and all the stuff. And we're just looking at it, and we're like, I guess, you know, a couple of years ago, we were like, well, we have to take it because the money runs out in four weeks, so let's take this contract. And this is where we're like looking at all our options, and we 
got to say something which we've never been able to say before, which is like, no thanks, I think we have better options, which is really exciting. And I think that's um, exciting for the whole, you know, it's just a part of the trend that's going on in the whole industry. So, um, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much.
um, how do you go about finishing a game and when do you think your game is finished? And also, can you sign my copy of Psychonauts? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to sign a copy of Psychonauts. And um, how do you finish a game? You know, um, you know, one of the, the things that I always struggle with, because I'm not very good with time and schedule, and um, so we've often finished games basically when we're out of money, and I go, <laughs> and then you go three more months in the sun. So um, uh, the thing that the discipline is hard to learn is, is you know, structuring your, your game so you actually have some space at the end of your money and you actually have time to polish and polish and polish. And that's where I think the games I really admire really manage to do that really well. Um, you know, have that, that you think your game's going to be done here, but you really usually always need three to six more months or a year or three years or five years to polish it, you know, and, um, and uh, so knowing what it's done, I, like I would never let any of the game, all, most of my games were just pulled out of my, like, cold, dead hands, you know, I would have a hard time letting go of them, so usually you can't swim them around, like, but it just, that's not how it should be, it should be when you polished it for, for a million years. <laughs> Any more questions? Any yeah, more questions out there? Just jump up and down really loud and just look at someone with a hat and make a jerky noise in there. Just shout out. Oh, yeah, I can hear my mic and speak loud. Yeah, because it'll really throw the mic at you and like impale your <laughs> Yes, I'll repeat your question. And you're, you're, you're asking about them completely like, in terms of text no, no, no. games? Or no, just... no, it's like uh, uh, when I play, I, I learn a lot of English, like you know, we're playing King's Quest, Quest, and all the and that. Uh, text is not there, and uh, today, I mean, even the basic texts clicks or clicks away, because they, they are just like, it's very... <laughs> <laughs> so, um... Yeah, I mean, um, we're talking, we're talking about dialogue in game in general. I mean, there's two things you could be talking about. Like, I um, text a game or writing a game, writing in games, and, and at first I thought you were talking about text adventures, which I wanted to mention, and those are really what, one of the things that got me into adventure games. I love the Infocom game, Scott Adams Adventures, and um, I love text adventures, and um, I haven't played them in a long time. Um, but writing in games is, is kind of a, in some ways a thankless, um, a thankless job that, like, um, Eric Wolpaw, who's a great writer, works on Psychonauts and works with Al on Portal and a bunch of fun stuff up there. Always refers to him as being a DJ in a strip club, which is like, <laughs> you're, you know, you're, you're putting on your little show and everyone is, is waiting for you to get off stage so that's going to happen. Uh, which, <laughs> uh, you know, that's certain kind of games, you know, people are not there for the writing, I guess. But I think in some way the, um, the burden is on the writers to just write better. I think um, there's a lot of bad writing in games, and I think it's actually totally understandable where people skip most of these because a lot of them are just really terrible and they're really long and there's really and um, I think editing is really important and, and, and writers need to just edit down the scenes to really be essential the essential dialogue. I'm not putting all the blame on writers, but I think um, you're responsible for keeping your audience's attention. I think you've got to make that cutscene unskippable, not by having your programmers make it unskippable, but make it unskippable <laughs> <it's talking> awesome. <laughs> I thought I would answer your question. There's a whole bunch of words to listen. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? I can't see a hand over there. I see a hand someone jumping up and down over there. I just heard someone say hi. Hi, I'm Anna. Hey. Uh, I'm interested. Uh, how, what kind of uh, workflow do you have in Double Fine? And how do you start to all the insights? You say workflow? Yeah. What kind of workflow do you have? Um, it, you know, it depends. Uh, sometimes when it's a game that I've Kind of like those like, side hustle for legend, there'll be some idea in the back of my head for years and years and years. And um, I'll often start telling just like one person because I'm really timid with those ideas. Like they, the first person you talk to, if they just don't make the right facial expression, I'll often just shove the idea completely. Like, I'll just, hey, what do you think about this game by Eddie Mel? I don't really like Eddie Mel. I'm not just going to 
that's, that's okay. That's just okay. But you, so you tell your person who's the nicest person that you know, and then that gives you the courage to talk to the second nicest person, and then eventually you start talking to people who will just tell you the truth no matter what. And then you're like, hey, you're wrong, like, you're perfect. But it's like it's a very confident building thing that goes through where I'm just going to slip it. It takes years to get those ideas out there. Um, and then, and then often we work with uh, concept artists to make the ideas in the head come to be something that everyone can see and how everyone can see, oh, this game can look amazing, and then how will it play? Um, we, we start actually trying to, we get, over the years we move much farther away from the big design documents and more to just rapid prototyping, like trying to get, get a, game, a little mini version of the game up and running like in those two weeks with the music partner process. So, that Amnesia Fortnite game jam is, is how pretty much all of our projects start now. So we have this working prototype of, of one game. Um, and the pressure of getting it done in two weeks helps us be disciplined by just having one game play mechanic instead of having like 800 different game play mechanics, you know, and trying to be really ambitious in that way. Just make one work. And then, um, and then our workflow, other than that, is pretty, yeah, pretty predictable for a lot of games. Which is <laughs> I you know, you know, we really care about not having crunch mode anymore because Cyclops is the worst crunch mode. I think like this five year crunch mode that was terrible. And everyone in the company and like mentioned crunch mode. Like, what? What? When? No, we're not. What? I quit. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. Everyone's very protective of their time now as they should be. So we really work hard to uh, schedule things better, use Scrum or agile development to like, try and minimize all that. And a lot of us in the company are kind of older, we have kids, and rather than we leave at a decent time because we're just getting trouble at home if we don't go home. So um, our families are much scarier than our, our producers. So <laughs> I think that's something the whole industry has moved away from. Like, crunch mode is just this thing that bad habit that game companies got in the habit of doing because you can basically exploit 20 year olds who come out of college. That's what they're doing in college, they're saying, I'm only making games. So now they'll do it here and um, they'll take a while to realize that we make three dollars and three cents an hour. That's when I calculated it at one point I was making with this art. So I was like, wow, I'm making three dollars and fifty cents an hour. I made more at the movie theater than I was in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so no more questions. It's over. Okay, any more, any more questions? How many do I have? How we deal with conflicts and how we inspire the team. Um, yeah, a lot of that can be handled in the hiring, in the hiring process, like making sure that you, you hire the right people. I mean, there are still, when you ever have you know, creative people in a room together, there's going to be disagreements. But if you, you kind of learn to sense that there's, there's certain people who are disagreeing because they're just passionate creative people, and everybody in the room has a different way they want to go forward, they all want to make a great game. But deep down, that's the only thing they care about is a great game. And usually, if that's the case with all the people, You'll watch all those different ideas converge on one great idea that's probably better than any individual idea that anyone had. And um, the only time it's a problem is when someone has a different agenda than making the game great. Like someone's like, I don't like this other person in the room, I'm gonna shoot down every idea they have, or I just I want my I want my name higher than credit. So something like that. It's more of a political motivation which you can have in a big company. But you try and spot people with those kind of priorities and don't hire them. Which is why we have the long interview process where we're really trying to get to know the people that are what you're doing, so we um, don't have to fire them later. And then, as far as how we run the teams, I, I always, I, I personally, like, I'm not even someone who, I don't really even want to be in charge, I just want to get games made, and, and, and someone's got to um, be in charge. But I don't you know, necessarily like bossing people around, because you no know, one likes people who boss them around. And um, I think of it as something like, um, you've you read Tom Sawyer, so, Tom Sawyer. so it, Tom Sawyer, He's got to paint a fence, and he's really annoying to paint a fence. So he acts like it's super, super fun, and then all the kids in the neighborhood come by and say, can I, can I do that? That looks fun. He goes, yeah, if you pay me, I'll let you paint this fence. And then pretty soon he's just sitting on the sideline watching all the neighborhood kids um, paint the fence where he counts his money. And I'm like, that's a little bit like what it's like to run a game. Because you, people are like, can I please? Can I please come do art on your game? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> a <laughs> so big trick. The whole thing is a big It's really good. Into 
a bigger one. Yes. Um, that's it. I mean, I've seen companies grow like, um, well, I've worked at one company, so I guess I've seen a company grow. <laughs> <laughs> And it was LucasArts. I started there when it was 40 people, and that was really fun. It felt like a little family. And by the time I left, it was about 300 people. And even and it kept growing, even at like 150 people, um, which is what we were, we were making like day of the tenth one. We were the company was about 150. I still knew the name of everybody who worked there. I knew everybody, even everyone in accounting. I knew everyone who was um, still really fun. And um, around 200 people. We started to be like, get someone in the hallway that didn't recognize and so stop me like, hey, what's your name? Are you new? And then around 250, or 300 people, the first time I remember seeing someone in the hallways and not knowing who they were and being like, ah, screw that, I'm not talking this person. And it took, totally changed what it was like to come to work every day. It was like, all of a sudden there were just strangers, so there were strangers in the hallways, and that took away a lot of that fun feeling of working in a, in a family. So I still think, um, there's, there's I, so I don't know how to keep the, the culture going you know, bigger than 150 people. Because all everyone has like a magic number, but I think 80 is a good maximum, you know, is um, usually about the size of their company. But um, <laughs> I don't know if there's a magic number, but just growing slowly. And um, we had to do, we had to kind of force everyone to keep talking to each other now that we're making multiple projects, like mix, having all these things where we mix people up because left to their own devices, people will trying to work on a thing they're working on and forget to talk to each other, which is, um, can be, a, can be a big problem. And then once you're so big, you have to be in separate rooms. Like, we're in pretty much one big open area. Um, but once you're on like, two floors, that can be a huge problem for a company because you can go upstairs, downstairs, and, and um, my advice is just always make sure you're upstairs, downstairs, and downstairs. All of that. <laughs> okay, I think that is all we have time for. Just now, starting to get some more questions. <laughs> Uh, yeah, good questions, Morgan. Very practical, excellent work. Uh, shall we give our appreciation uh, to the